Welcome to Full Throttle RC. I'm your host, Tony Kestrowa. This great show on the internet television is produced by Warehouse Hobbies. Welcome to today, segment B of our radio show. We were talking in, the, in segment A about radios, purchasing radios, hooking them up. Today I want to go into depth with doing some silver repair. Also show you some tricks of the trade on how to keep your radio working, how to keep them from getting wet, and a bunch of neat stuff. So we'll be right back. All right, when I left you guys last time, we were working with this system right here, showing you the workings that go into the model boat itself, the receiver end, the servos, the switch, battery pack, everything that goes into the radio box. I took the, steer, uh, the throttle servo off and replaced it with the quarter scale like we had for the steering. And I wanna, I wanna talk about something that's very, very common, okay? That is a quarter scale servo or a steering servo with broken gears. So, and readjusted them. And ob obviously we sell gear sets to repair them and stuff like that. But sometimes I talk to guys over the phone and say, well, I need you to unscrew the four screws in, in your servo. And as soon as I get to that point, they're going, oh, 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 can, I, can I send it into somewhere? Can I send it to you? And, and I'm going to show you guys how easy this really is. And I'm going to go into the theory of how this thing works. And when I show you how it works internally, you're going to go, man, you're going to want to take all your servos apart tonight, okay? Just don't do that. You, you know, use something you're not using until you get the hang of it. Okay, we got it hooked up here. Let me turn it on to show you that it does work. Okay, look at the torque these things put out. That's why I like them. Okay, I know that if you give your boat a right hand turn, it's going to make a right hand turn. All right, let's turn it off and let's talk about a couple things. The only reason I'm going to be in that servo is if it gets wet and I know it's wet inside. If I'm getting a hum, let's say you've got a servo that's constantly humming, you've discon and first thing you do is you want to disconnect whatever's hooked up to it and see if the hum stops. In the first show, you'll see that if, uh, if, I, if I told you if you put you know, strenuous activity on that servo when it's in a neutral position, it, could cause it, it will cause it to hum. It's going to cause it to try to... What's happening is the servo's told to go back to the center and it's being pushed off center. And it's trying to constantly force its way back to the center. So it's, in, that, in essence, it's operating. Not good for it, but it's operating, okay? So let's say you got a hum, and you disconnect it, and that hum doesn't go away. It just sits there and goes, mm, and vibrates on you. Well, we got to get into it. Worse, you ran the boat, you flipped your boat over, it was violent. You come back, and the rudders are flaccid. Servo just makes zzz zzz sounds, and nothing happens. Well, you strip some teeth in the gears. It's time to rebuild it, okay? So let's go through taking it apart. First thing we're going to do is we're going to get a little Phillips screwdriver, and we're going to remove the control horn on the top. I'm going to do this rather quick because Chris has been yelling at me, but I've taken a little bit too much time on these shows. And I know you guys want me to do them quicker sometimes. Some of you guys. Some of you guys like them and pop the popcorn, and other guys say, hey, can't you tell me in five minutes to stop talking so much? Well, you know, what can I say? You've got four screws on the bottom on this particular one, which is a high-tech, okay, HS755HB. I love this servo. We've sold them for years. Almost flawless. Okay, let's remove these four. Okay. Now, these are called water-resistant servos. There's no such thing, guys, as waterproof. Waterproof, an old man told me once in electronics class that the only thing waterproof is a duck's ass, and I absolutely believe that. You take that to the bank. Okay, we're removing the bottom of it. Now, when we remove the bottom here, there's a gasket that's, in this case, stayed on, and there's a circuit board. You're seeing the base of the circuit board. It's all microcircuitry. Also, you can see the bottom of the, the motor, the electric motor, which is, this is a large motor in this thing. It's, as, it's almost as long as this case is deep here, okay? But almost the size of a quarter, okay? Now, once we remove those four screws, here's where everybody's afraid of. The watch springs go flying out, okay? And they do sometimes. There's a series of gears. Okay, Chris, I'm going to start laying this out so you can kind of maybe show the people at home what it looks like inside there. All right, now I'm going to do this slowly so we can do this. We're going to remove the gears. Most importantly, we want to remember the position they're in. You know, we've got to put new ones in. So the top one with the spline would push out first. And I like to always, and I do this with everything I do, guys, I lay them out in the order they came out, in the direction they came out. Okay? Like that and that. So this is going to tell me that this gear went in the middle, this gear went here. Now, obviously, I've done this for many years, so you get to the point where you don't have to do this stuff. Okay, that leaves the two main gears on the servo. Now, when you buy a servo replacement kit, you get all of them, okay? And 
You can, you can take them all out if you want. I'm going to, rather than waste a lot of time, I'm going to leave that one in there right here, okay? The main one. But if I was replacing this servo set, regardless, even if I had one tooth broke or two teeth broke in the main, replace the whole set. They're very cheap. I think they're 8 or 9 $10, so it's worth doing it. Now, remember we talked about the humming sound? Let me tell you, let's, let me get some tools here so I can kind of do this where you can see it. Because I want to show you what that humming sound really is and how these work. Okay, let's turn, the, I'm going to turn this system on, okay, and watch this. And by leaving that gear in there, we can actually see that servo operate, all right? If I didn't, the you'd, you'd, only thing you'd be seeing running right now would be the pinion gear on the motor, which would be quite difficult. So we're going to leave this bottom gear in so you can see it. Now, the reason that servo is turning is because it doesn't know how to get the center. It can't get the center without these gears, all right? And it also could be the reason why you're getting a servo hum, or is the reason, I mean, it could be bad component inside, but generally, the reason you're getting a servo hum would be that it doesn't know where center is, okay? Now, what, what tells the servo that it's at center? It is as simple as you can believe. You see this thing with the, right here with the bearing on it? This is a little potentiometer, just like a volume control on your radio or television. Remember, we used to have those. Now everything's push buttons, still a potentiometer, electronically, but it's a potentiometer that's a mechanical, all right? And it's very simple. This determines whether or not the motor runs clockwise or counterclockwise, which is determined by the positioning of the gears on the servo. So because I've disassembled everything, it doesn't know any better. So watch what happens if I carefully take these, these needle nose pliers and I put them on the potentiometer and I slightly turn, watch this, towards center. I'm, I can literally stop, see how it's just barely moving? It will just take a drop more, oh, I went a little too far. See, did you see how it changed directions? When it went to the right, it changed directions. Watch this, we'll do this for a second. And when I go to the left, it changes directions this way. This is what's telling the servo to stop. So because of the gear train in there, as it turns, when it hits center, it's telling the motor to stop working. Once it tells the motor to stop working, the servo is, in essence, in neutral. Now, what's causing the bind or possibly causing the bind in your servo? That potentiometer's off a little bit. And all you have to do is carefully take it apart. Now, again, these, these pliers were too big. At this point, you'd use a pair of tweezers. I got very lucky that I actually got it in the center with these big, heavy, tough pliers because you would not believe how critical and how little bit it takes to move that. Actually, as you're putting it together, you can screw it all up. But that's what centers the servo and makes it stop. In this case, I'm centered now. The motor stopped. Okay? So when I put it back together with the new gears, everything's going to work fantastic. And what's happening, remember when I said ex excessive pressure on your arm causes it? Think about what's happening. You're putting pressure on the arm. In essence, is turning the gears enough to where it's moving that potentiometer, and the potentiometer is trying to fight it back in the center position, and you're fighting it out. So it, the, the servo's constantly trying to do this. Constantly. That's what the hum is coming from, or the, that you hear, that brrr. And once you get these things centered, basically, unless you have a bad potentiometer, you can do this at home. So again, take a good look at what it looks like in there, and when we come back, we'll put this together and make this servo work again. Because it is brand new, and one of you guys are going to get this. One of you lucky guys are going to call in and order a high-tech HS755, and you're going to get the signature series right here. All right, let's get this puppy back together so we can get it back in a box so I can sell it. All right, remember, we've got everything on right now. We centered the potentiometer. And again, we'll be able to center that later during the assembly and a lot easier. I just want to show you what this little unit looks like and how it works. And that's the potentiometer, okay? So basically now we want to put this thing back together the way we've taken it apart. So the first gear being this large gear, the one that looks like a hat, okay, that will slide down over the motor shaft and pinion gear like this, okay? And that'll be followed basically by the main gear. We're going to do the main shaft. But let, me, let me break into this. This is very important. Make sure to put this on properly that you remove the little O-ring up here, which is just rubber on this shaft, and along with the top bearing. Very important that top bearing gets removed, okay? And then it can be put in properly. Now, 
there's a tab on the top of the main spline gear. You'll, you'll see this little tiny tab. See if you can zoom in there, Chris, so they can take a look at this. And I'll point at it. It's right here. All right. This tab corresponds with the inside case cover of the servo. And you'll notice molded into this servo case are two stops. So that tab basically is a stop, a hard stop is what we call it in the machine industry. Okay, so that has to correspond there or it isn't going to fit. So we'll call this the front of the servo where the wire is coming out and this tab we'll call the front. So we're going to take it and we're going to carefully, and again, you don't have to worry about offset, upsetting it right now like I just did because we can tune it out now. We have a large gear to, to mess with, okay? The smaller ones are a little bit more difficult. The big servos like this big quarter scale, easier. Everything's bigger. Just kind of now take this main servo and kind of turn it in the direction required to get it to stop. And I mean, when, when I say stop, I mean I don't want to hear any humming at all. You want to find the true center. Okay, okay, after which you can put the final gear in. Now before we put these gears in, it's very important that you get a, a plastic safe, safe lithium, a very light lithium grease, and you can apply some grease to the gears because they are gears. So if this servo is a rebuild because you went upside down and you're taking it out and going to blow it all out, it's important that you re-grease the gears, okay? And, and obviously you'll set your servo. Now, what you want to be careful is putting the last one together because we got to find the spline here, okay? So we're going to, and, and I can actually move it out of position like I did, okay? And I did. I can feel, I can actually feel that servo right now trying to move a little bit. So I'm going to raise this up carefully and I'm going to move it slightly to where I don't hear any noise, which is right there. And the gear trains back the way it was designed and watch, we'll make it work. Now, can you understand what's happening here? The potentiometer is telling that motor when it's in center. So if the potentiometer is in center, the motor is getting no, no, no command to go left or right. So that's how the system's working. And that's how the gear train works in a servo. And you can see, now that we've got this apart, look how big these servos are. Okay? These are big pitch gears, the main one especially. This is the one that takes all the abuse, the one that the horn's on. So it's a multiple gear train, so that's where they're getting their power from. But it's the large teeth that enable that servo to take more of a shock when it's when exerted upon like the rudder. Okay, now that you've done this, you can put the back together, you put your bearing back on the spline. Okay? Be careful doing this, okay? You, we don't want to damage it. And you know, you might have to use some tools to do this. Okay, be really, you know, gingerly with this stuff, guys. Okay, it'll snap on when it's in all the way. Okay, then don't forget the rubber O-ring seal, which is miniature. All right. Okay, now we're going to put the case back together like this. And don't forget it has a little rubber, and I didn't upset that. There's a rubber gasket around here. Okay, the bottom. Let's talk about the bottom. In the event you get the circuit wet, I'm not going to go too far into depth with this. When this whole system is taken apart in the top, there's screws there that will allow you to remove the motor and this whole circuitry board can come out. Let's say you get this thing wet and it, you can't get it to work, okay? And you have no choice but to remove everything. You can remove the guts out of this and you can get a good electronic spray, something that's safe. Again, I'm, I can't tell you this enough, safe for plastic. It must say safe for plastic use electronic component spray. That's a, that, that's a spray that you can directly spray onto a component to dry it. Okay? Sometimes you can get, what, what happens is water will form, fresh water can form on there and, and make like calcium and, and nasty stuff and then it can actually short these tiny chips. And just by taking your spray and a small old toothbrush, kind of cleaning it, you can make a servo work that was rendered once useless. Now salt water, that's a whole other issue. Salt water is such a good conductor you get what they call electrolysis and a lot of times if you get a servo damaged in salt water, most of the time, and I'm, I mean, I've saved a few, if you can get them quick enough and you can get it out of the water, because if the component is on and it's in the salt water, you have problems. Uh, generally, fresh water, most of the time, almost 100%, you can make these things work again. Fresh salt water, that's iffy, guys. Try it. Don't, don't give up. Try it. Okay. Let's put this back together, though, so we can get this thing back together. Again, we have the rubber seal on there. Then it just requires to put the four long bolts back into the case and tighten them up. Okay, 
We won't get into that right now. We'll finish it up off camera here. But I'll get it tight so we don't lose anything. So, sort of. All right. And just snug. It's not, you're only going into nylon, so, you know, don't be over it. Don't over tighten it. Once you feel them bottom out, give it a, a little bit more. Okay. Okay, you'll know you're right. You'll watch the seals compress on it. You know, if you start seeing the seals squeeze out or the plastic bow, that's a good indication that you're too tight. Okay, because after that, it's stripping. Okay, that's basically it. That servo is as good as new. And when one of you lucky guys gets it, you won't know that it wasn't. Hey, it could be the one that was used on the show today. Anyway, that is how we rebuild a quarter scale servo or standard servo and readjust the potentiometer to find center. So, you have strip a set of gears. Don't throw away a $50 servo. Buy a set of $10 gears. Now you can do it yourself. Let's talk about the receiver. Let's talk about fixing a receiver that possibly got wet. You brought your boat back and everything's jumping around. Nothing works. Because if you get these things saturated with water, you know, they're, they're not going to work properly. Now we're going to use another one to show you. This is also a Fataba receiver. I'm going to show you what to do generally if you get your boat upside down and your radio box gets water. If a radio box, let me stop up. If a radio box is done properly, okay, it's taped, lid taped on right, screws up to manufacturer screws. If it's done properly and designed properly, I don't think any of, any of us can guarantee that we can't get water in the boat in the radio box. And, and that being that, if the boat goes upside down, especially in a mono hull with a v, the bow bobs around on the boat, the bottom of the boat is three feet underwater. The pressure is really great, and water pressure will find a way in. Even if you got that lid taped on, fantastic. Okay, it can find a way in through a fitting, um, through an antenna tubes are notorious. So make sure that the, that's why we are so adamant about our our design and antenna tube. Okay, plus I don't recommend putting the antenna tubes in the radio box lid unless you have to. And, and if you do so, make sure you have a water, some type of water resistant base and also the cap. So when the boat goes underwater, you don't have the water coming in the tube. Throttle cables are another notorious problem. And if you notice on Enforcer boats, for the last couple of years, we've had a little boot made that goes on the opposite side by the engine so water can't backtrack easily into the radio box. But even with that said, and grease in there and everything, it doesn't take much. You know, water's tough. I mean, it's a tough thing to keep out. Okay, so let's come, let's 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 figure that you brought your boat back. Everything's jittery, and you turned it up. You pulled the hatch cover off, and you can actually put fish inside the radio box, and they'd survive for a couple of days. That's a lot of water. Okay, we're going to dump it all out. We're going to take the components apart. We know how to do a servo now. We showed you a few minutes ago. But let's take the receiver. Most of the receivers, if not all of them, either have a little a uh, little keyway to put a screwdriver in, or a, or have screws on the bottom. And today, these companies are getting pretty savvy. Okay, they're making it easy to open them up. First thing you want to do is remove the crystal. Okay, and that's the crystal. This is the thing right here. And this is the receiver crystal. Okay, the transmitter has a crystal in it designed for the transmitter, and the both of them are compatible. And let's open the box. And in this case, you'll see, you'll see that I spent four years in electronic school from 1976 to 19, I guess, 80, and there's absolutely nothing in here that I can fix. And at that time, there wasn't probably a computer or television that I couldn't fix, okay? So that was pretty much a waste of time. All right, this is called flat circuitry, guys. No, no, no kidding aside. I have a great technician that works here part-time when I need him. His name's Frank. And Frank was one of the last of the, the Apollo boys. I mean, literally, the Apollo boys. So uh, he stayed with it. And when I get stumped and we talk, we talk together, I always, I think he knows that I'm kind of limited on the electronic you know, end of it, but he, he humors me pretty well and he's taught me pretty good. Uh, this is called flat circuitry. Whereas years ago, there was a ton of stuff on that board, like anything else, not necessary. That chip, that prom chip right here is doing, doing the whole deal here. And even, and this receiver is probably five years old, so I'm certain today they're even smaller than this. Obviously, look at the size of the one that, that we were using. So flat circuit technology is coming a long way. Okay, we've taken the circuit board out. The first thing we do, there's a couple components in here that's possible to get water in here. You've got a couple RF tuners, uh, the, the, the pin holder for the chip, for the, for the crystal. You know, you have another tuner there. You know, that's, you can, we can get the water out. We're going to use a displacement spray. We're going to need the bot. You're going to have to purchase a, a con, it, it used to be called contact cleaner. If you go to Radio Shack or go to any electronic store and say, look, I need a spray displacer. Not, and and you, don't have, you don't want anything with lubrication. You want something that's safe on electronics that's going to displace moisture. 
You can literally spray it. We, and I think we sell it too. I think we have some stuff. Obviously, we use it, so we have to sell it. Um, spray it directly on the circuit board. Bottom side, top side, especially in these tuners. And it, you know, it'll dissipate really quickly. And it's designed to do that. And then shake it out a little bit. And look at the bottom of the board. Especially, and I'll tell you something, if you guys get these things wet, it is immediately this. You don't wait a couple of days. The more, you let, the, the more time that you waste between cleaning this stuff is the more time that odds are you're going to buy a new receiver. And I, I can tell you right now, a radio system is what, under $100? You start buying receivers, you're going to pay $60, $70 for a receiver. So, not a good idea. Remember I was telling you about deposits and stuff that could form on the bottom? Look at the bottom of the circuit board real good. If you shunt any of these pads, that, that aren't designed to be shunted. In other words, you short them. That you can have, you can have calcium on there. You can have, you can have iron in the water. Could actually shunt two soldered tabs together and make this thing useless, not work. So spray it up. Get a, get an old toothbrush. Clean it real good. Okay. If you do all this, dry it off properly. Odds are, in again in fresh water. Salt water just really doesn't count. I mean, you do it. You try it. You know, usually in salt water, the first thing, I, and I didn't tell you guys that, is I took the product, I used to put it in fresh water and let it sit in fresh water a few minutes to kill the salt, after, the, you know, the salt activity, and then try it. But generally in, in a fresh water condition, I, I fixed many, many receivers, okay? Now, this is another thing I want to touch on. We're, we're messing with the electronics here, especially the receivers. It is so important that you do a range check after this and make sure the range checks. I don't want to give you guys the okay to say, hey, yeah, you can... You could fix a water soap receiver and everything's great. This thing has to range check out also. If a radio got wet and, and it's giving you, it's a little iffy and you have the slightest doubt in your mind that it's doing what you want it to do, get the thing off to high tech or, or Fataba or Electronics or whoever else you bought your radio for. Get it, get it to their service center. It's very inexpensive. I, I hear guys, they tell me $30, $40, and then when they get it, they retune it. Okay, and they make sure when you get it back, it's up to snuff and it's safe to operate. Okay? So basically, that's all you have to do to get through a quick receiver cleaning, okay? And get your receiver back up into proper working order once it was wet. There's so much I want to talk about the radio systems, okay? We might even go into another show because I want to get into troubleshooting. Uh, that's very common. Guys call me and, and I'm, I'm over the phone or emailing and telling them how to troubleshoot. Usually I give them a list of things to do prior to having to send the radio off. And most of the time they call me and say, hey, it worked. I got my radio working right, okay? But what's really important is I want to go through some tips on safeguarding and things to prevent damage like water damage and stuff to a radio system. So we might have to break from this show and, and follow up with a show on, on troubleshooting and, um, and we'll do that in the future, okay? But more important, let me show you a couple different things. We talked about the, the radio being as waterproof or tight. I mean, those are two tough words. I mean, I come from the electronics industry, and the words waterproof and watertight are um, something that most manufacturers don't want to say. Remember what I told you. Okay, I'm going to give you some tricks. Usually, if a boat goes upside down and you can't get to it quickly, within a couple minutes, the pressure will will eventually get into something and it'll leak a little bit of water. And I need a little water. I mean, I've had boats underwater for an hour or two before, you know, I want to tell you guys, we might go out to the lake and one of my guys forgets the boat or doesn't think we need it because we're so great, you know. So three hours later, I'll pick up the cell phone and want to know where they are and they're standing by the shore waiting for the wind to change direction. And I know you've all been there, okay. So that radio box is subject to being underwater for quite some time. Okay, I'll tell you a couple things we do at Warehouse Hobbies, religiously, stuff I've been doing for 30 years. Okay? Number one, there is nothing wrong at all with protecting that receiver and battery box, especially with loose batteries, from water. And there's a couple good methods. Years ago, believe it or not, we used to use condoms. But as I've been married now for 30 years... I was told that they cost quite a bit of money today, so most of the guys have gone back the old faithful balloon. Speaking of condoms, did you guys know there's serial numbers at the bottom base of a condom? No. I guess you don't have to roll them down that far. Anyway, Chris, you didn't think that was funny? <laughs> okay, let's talk about what we can do to safeguard these from water. We can stretch a balloon over a battery pack like this, okay? Put a little, twist it a couple times and get a little uh, 
bread wrap tie or tie wrap and tighten it up. And we virtually, guys, have a waterproof seal. We can put that battery underwater, providing that you twisted this good, put a tie on there. I can't see how it would be possible outside of a leak that that water would get into that rubber boot, would you? No, absolutely not, okay? The same thing can be done in a receiver. The key to this is it takes time. And, and I know, I, I, I speak to a lot of you guys, we need to learn how to take time in preparing our stuff. Because listen, the extra 10 minutes, okay, I've told many of you guys this, I race cars for a hobby, okay? If we don't prepare, we can die. It's as simple as that, okay? I start sometimes on Wednesday to race on Saturday. I'm 150 miles an hour and I'm going to show up to the track five minutes before the race and hope to hell that all my stuff's in good working order. That's not really smart, okay? So, and I have to work on that myself. I make myself checklists because I too have that tendency to be on the little on the lazy side or hey, you know, them seatbelts are good. I've had them, what, three years? You know, they're good. Well, they, you know, you test stuff, guys, always, and you get yourself safeguarded. So it, that's what the word is, safeguard, okay? So you take that extra few minutes before you go to run your boat. Literally, what, 10 minutes to do this, okay? And pretty much we know if we go upside down, and we get a bad leak in the radio box. The worst thing we're going to lose are the servos. And the servos are expendable. They're easy to get. They're easy to fix. Okay? Receivers aren't. Okay? And another bad thing is, especially with a loose battery pack like this, this is one of the killers. Okay? You guys that put these battery packs in the boats, including mine, with a little slit we make, without being protected, with either a battery box case, a rubber balloon, and rubber bands put around it, okay? you're out there jumping those boats, having a good old time. One of these times you're going to take that Magnum 57 or Manta Ray or Team Enforcer and you're going to launch off a wave, you're going to hit it. The shock is going to knock a battery out of the holder. That radio receiver has no idea what to do because it can't do anything without power. Okay, we'll get into that later. There is some things, some safeguards. But let's say that you don't invest in those kind of fail safes. Okay, it is completely up to you whether or not that radio system is working or not working. How much time you want to get involved with preparing. Okay, so if you're using a loose battery pack, we, 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 we want to put them in a balloon. We want to put a rubber band around them. We want to make sure those batteries can't come out. Now we know when we put it in that box, we can bounce around pretty much and not worry about having a problem with power or the loss of it. Same with the receiver. We want to put it in a balloon. We want to do the same thing. We want to twist it, bring all the wires like so. Okay, it's a little bit of a pain in the butt. It takes a little bit of time. Okay? And the worst problem is, get this, okay? When we're done for the day, these got to come out of the balloons because there's the same, you know, we can do the same amount of damage preventing as we can by leaving it. And, and what happens is condensation. Just like if you leave the radio box taped up, okay? The humidity can actually form inside the balloon. Air is oxygen. Oxygen is, has water in it, okay? Or the, 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 the oxygen carries water molecules. The water can condensate in there. Three months later, you go to take your boat out of the shed. You open up the balloon and the receiver is no good or the battery is all corroded. So it's really important when we're done for the day that we remove the balloons. Okay, or condoms if you've got extra money or extra laying around. Okay, but anyway, that is really important. Okay, is the balloons. And they're cheap, and these are just standard ones that I think they buy them at Family Dollar or somewhere for a dollar fifteen of them, guys, so that we can all afford that. Okay, before I leave you with this show, one of the neatest things that I came across that I started doing back when I was probably 15 years old, I got this idea one day. Because back then we were making all our radio boxes, and I used to go nuts trying to make, you know, first we had screws, and I hate screws. You start with 16 of them, and the next time you go out, you log, you just got 14. Before you know you got two holding it on. Well, that's useless. You might as well have no cover on the box, okay? Get yourself some dry sponges. Go to the store, Winn-Dixie, Publix, wherever you shop. Get your wife to buy you some if you're afraid to go in and buy some sponges. Just dry sponges like this, okay? Put them in the bottom of the radio box. Now... Remember what I said? Usually if a boat goes upside down, you might get four or five teaspoons, a couple tablespoons of water. I mean, what could be a half a cup? If you've got a sponge this big, dry at the bottom of that box, water gets in that box, right to the sponge, every bit of it, until you saturate that sponge to the capacity that it can hold, you keep it away from the radio equipment. These are simple things you can do to make it so it's super easy to run a boat safely and not have problems. And there should be no reason for problems. God knows I've made it kind of easy for you guys to go out there and spend hours. I can remember the days where to spend 20 minutes running a model boat took several hours of preparation. Unfortunately, and I say unfortunately, today we're getting a little complacent. Today we can go out and spend five, six, seven hours and we've gotten complacent on the time that it takes to prepare the products right and safely to operate, okay? 
That's all I want to tell you about the simplicity of the radio system for gas model boating or any model boating or airplanes or helicopters or cars because all this applies. It's all about being safe and not hurting ourselves, hurting somebody else, or damaging somebody else's property. We're going to get into a next show. We'll, we'll touch on some safeguards, some issues, some electronic components that can be purchased to safeguard a radio system that, from things that are out of our control. But if we keep them in our control and do what we're supposed to do, we should be good to go to play with model boating like I have done for the last 30 years before any of this existed. I appreciate you joining me on Full Throttle RC. This is Tony Castronovo, and I'm out of here.